Welcome back to the Telecom TV Cloud Native Telco Summit and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the second of two live Q&A shows today. In fact, it's the final live Q&A show for this year's summit. So this really is your last chance to quiz our panelists and guests. Now we've just seen the panel discussion that looked at the evolution of network functions from VNFs to CNFs. And now we're going to expand on that, answer whatever questions you have on the subject and also anything on cloud native telco, because this, as I said, is your last opportunity. Now, if you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now using the Q&A form on the website. Joining me for this live Q&A show is, as always, Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director here at Telecom TV. Ray, the end is nigh, but we have covered a lot of ground over these past two days. Yes, well, I hope the end is not quite nigh, but I go, uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic summit with lots of great insights from many corners of the, of the industry. And the great news is it ain't over yet. So for those tuning in, get your questions in pronto because we have a very lively set of speakers here today to answer them. Yes, pronto, toot sweet, as they say in Dick Van Dyke movies, because this is absolutely the last Q&A show of what has been a terrific summit. So let's now meet our guests who have returned to help answer all your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are... Miguel Caramis, who is Executive Director, Cloud and Technology Planning, Global Network and Technology at Verizon Wireless. Neil McRae, Managing Director, Architecture and Technology Strategy and Chief Architect for BT. Ahmed Zadi, Telco Cloud NFE 5G Core Architect at Orange. Heather Kirksey, VP Ecosystem and Community for LF Networking. And Ilda Kovancha, Senior Manager, Community and Ecosystem at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Excellent panel discussion earlier. Plenty of Star Trek references there. So let's now take a look at our audience questions. And Ray, have you got our first one? Uh, yes, I do. Thanks, Guy. One of many that we've had in. And Miguel, let me put this one to you first. Uh, what do you think about having all the functions in the cloud and having uh, MEC mobile edge compute as near as possible to the DURU in the mobile network? Yeah, great, great question actually and, and uh, very aligned with kind of like what we are building on the Verizon side. So, you know, all, um, all applications, whether RAN and core have uh, been in the cloud, uh, it's already a reality for us. Um, we just announced actually earlier this week that we've hit the 8,000 uh, VRAN nodes being deployed in the network a little bit earlier this year. So that's already happening. Uh, all Nearly all core applications, 4G, 5G, and IMS are virtualized already and in the cloud. I guess they, they, you know, we always talk about our telco cloud, right? The, the Verizon cloud platform that we use for our workloads. So that's uh, that's already the case. And then Mac, we we are uh, working towards that. Uh, I'd say uh, where we are in the journey, the uh, Mac instances are deployed a little bit higher up in regional data centers, not necessarily down at the run. Um, the deployment at the run, like much denser, uh, becomes really a use case driven business case that uh, has to develop still. This is many more instances, much more complexity to orchestrate and deploy workloads and manage. And, and then those um, instances have very different characteristics too. Right? Like the, the deeper you go into the network, the closer to the edge, uh, the lesser amount of compute you can deploy, the lesser space, different uh, security characteristics. So we are trialing actually that actively uh, in uh, testing with some third parties already. But as far as deploying uh, make instances in say like all 8,000 grand locations that we have right now and the many more that will be deployed over the next couple of years, that'll be driven by use cases and, and business needs. Okay, great. Thanks for that update from the uh, Verizon perspective there. Um, okay, if there isn't anybody else that wants to come in on this particular question, 
Um, I think we can just move on because we've got plenty to get through. Uh, so back over to you, Guy. Yeah, thank you very much, Ray. As you say, we have got quite a few questions to still to cover off today. Um, Neil, perhaps I could come to you first on, on this next one we have. Um, the question is, can we have some insight or light on how ML and AI is used with network observability to provide feedback and improve network KPIs of Telco Cloud. Is, is this something you can uh, you give us some insights on? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, first of all, I think um, we talk a lot about AI and ML, but I think I would, I would start by saying we're still at the very early development. The maturity level is fairly low, but actually here at BT, we have more uh, AI patents than any other company in, in Telco in the UK. Uh, we, we started working in this space uh, over 10 or 11 years ago because we knew the network was headed to a place where humans would no longer be able to, to run it. And, and that's where we're at. And so we're using uh, ML and AI um, to, to do anomaly detection, to really see, you know, today the world looked like this, but now it's look, it looks different. Why is that? What's changed? Is it something we need to worry about? Is it something that we, we then need to reset and, and have the automation auto restore? Um, we have some of that working on, on some parts of our um, telco cloud platform, network cloud at BT, um, that, that are, that's running on our 5G uh, standalone platform and, and, and serving actually multi, um, multi service. So we're also doing 4G and, and 5G non standalone. So we have that running today. It's kind of, it's kind of in a mode of help the operator rather than do too much by itself whilst it's still get into grips because in, in effect you have to train this technology and, and as I say we're using our own um, BT made IP here we are working with with some of our other partners um, to, to to build AI solutions one of them NetBrain a really fantastic company it's got amazing technology and, and what that's allowing us to do is just fix things quicker to start with and um, but also start predicting what the experience is going to be like for customers. So where we want to get to is literally in the morning, much like telecom TV's fantastic morning uh, news, we want a morning news of here is what we expect the network to be like. And actually, you know, and, and actually because we're going to see rain or because we're going to see something, you know, there's a, a big demand coming in or a big application going to run today then we're actually taking proactive measures to ensure that doesn't have a detrimental effect to customer experience. As I said, it's very early days, um, but it looks exciting. It looks like it's going to deliver for us. And, and really, um, uh, you know, I'll say this again, humans are too slow and there's not enough of us to run networks of today. If we want to get to that microsecond network dependency, um, AI, ML, automation, and probably other technologies we don't know yet, are going to be crucial in us taking the network in that direction. Great, thanks, Neil. That's, that's uh, fascinating insights there. Uh, and Heather, you'd like to uh, come in with some insights of your own. Yeah, well, and and it uh, follows on um, as Neil was saying about the training of the AI that that requires data sets. Um, it's very easy to just do the data sets that are within your own company or within your own business unit. And one of the things that we are trying to do right now in Linux Foundation is um, create um, a, a structure and a framework because you know people don't want to say, this is my Verizon data, this is my BT data, this is my Orange data, um, but to, to make it cleared so that we get data from around the world and globally to train the AIs that are being developed. Because if you're not going broad, you are likely to have your own internal biases reflected in some of those AIs. And um, that, that will have issues. I mean, I, I'm not trying to go into some of the race and, and gender issues um, that happen there and more and, and stick with the business uh, situation. But, um, you know, we are trying to get um, data from around the world to train the AIs better. 
um, from an open source perspective and in a protective and understanding um, the the non-disclosure requirements around some of that. And so I just, I want to basically say for, for those of you out there, uh, we are doing this. And if you think that that will help your business, um, we're doing it and in a protective and very, pro and in a very open source fashion. Great, Thank, thanks. thanks so much, Heather. You know, we've had so many questions on the subject of AI and ML and how it all intersects with cloud native. Uh, Miguel, you'd like to come in as well? Yeah, so I just wanted to add on, on top of uh, the use cases that Neil mentioned, right? Like the operational, proactive support, issue detection, and so on. We're also using AI for forecasting purposes, right? Like uh, as Neil said, these networks are only becoming more complicated and more complex. There are more uh, variations and permutations of the underlying technology, server capabilities that we're deploying, and then the applications that want to use it, and some of the all their uh, forecasting methods just don't scale well or, or, or might end up resulting in more investment that's needed or uh, under utilization of the resources and so on. So we are also using AI and ML to make uh, forecasting decisions. Right? We still use data provided by the engineering teams responsible for each of the application or the data centers, but then we run it through AI models to true it up based with uh, on historical data. Great, thanks very much, Miguel. Um, I think if, if uh, I think we should move on in that case, um, Ray. Let me uh, hand back over to you because, uh, as we keep saying, we've got so many questions to get through. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Guy. Um, so the next question that we've had from our audience is: um, <clears throat> Many telcos are not adopting open source and standards yet but continue to, to depend on vendor specific technology. Is that because of a lack of maturity of open standards and technologies, or are there other factors influencing the lack of open source uptake in telecoms? Uh, Heather, would you like to start on this one? I'm guessing you might have something to say about this one. Yeah, I mean, all right. So first of all, I just have to say what, telecoms are not adopting standards. That does not sound like how the internet works. Um, I just have a little bit of um, not okayness with some of the bit of the question. Um, we don't have 5G Im being implemented without 3GPP standards. So standards are being implemented. They've been implemented since uh, DARPA handed over the internet to the IETF. Um, um, in terms of open source, there's actually a ton of open source um, in the the networks. I mean, uh, OpenStack, for example, uh, was deployed, I think, probably throughout about 70% of global service providers. And now that we're moving to Kubernetes, I think that it's probably close to about 60% um, of global service providers, things like DPTK, things like Linux. There's not a server out there that doesn't have Linux on it. So open source is there. I think maybe what this uh, uh, questioner is asking is some of the specifics of things like ONAP, perhaps, or ORAN. Um, and that is taking things like the RAN not just softwareizing it, but also using open source to do it. Um, I am hearing from a lot of service providers that they are doing that work. Um, it is challenging, first of all, to move things to software. And that's hard. And I think that we shouldn't I don't know, tell people that they're not doing a good job when it takes some time to do something challenging. Um, but then also it is um, occurring with more and more, for example, ORAN technology is going into how the RAN is deployed. Um, and I do hear it from a lot of service providers. So um, I guess I would say that to this question, stuff is happening that people aren't necessarily talking about but that they are doing inside their uh their operation centers yeah I, I i'm pretty sure probably the question is coming from a kind of very uh telco function specific side here rather than ge a general open source i guess 
Um, and, and there's always been this sort of accusation of, you know, telcos have been, or the industry has been talking about this for years, but not a lot seems to be happening, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, I mean, Ildeco, do you think it's, uh, you know, what, what's the current state? Are things moving on quicker than they were before in terms of, uh, you know, uh, network operators starting to use more and more open source based uh, systems and platforms? I think the short answer is yes, but I will not stop talking here. Um, reflecting back to some of the things that, that Heather mentioned, uh, for instance, we just closed the recent OpenStack user survey, so I can't uh, disclose all the numbers yet we will publish them really soon still aggregating data but like uh, the number of cores managed by OpenStack almost doubled um, since the last survey uh, that we uh, that we concluded a year ago so uh, there is definitely I believe um, a time period that is needed for organizations to to catch up so like uh, large operators are jumping on open source solutions faster they have more people they have some more bandwidth to experiment with open source and and figuring figuring out what that is what it means to use open source software uh within their deployments and uh i believe that uh, more and more operators uh smaller operators also tier two tier three operators are just getting there to uh uh, kind of follow that path that that the uh, the global um, larger operators um, started to walk on, and like mentioning uh, another example, we we have another opening for a project. It's called Starting X. It is actually creating a fusion between OpenStack and Kubernetes, and it shows very well how the two can and are used together. And um, that is that is a project that is running in production, for instance, um, in Verizon's and Vodafone's 5G and, and ORAN uh, deployments out there already. So uh, it, it really shows how operators are uh, taking and uh, integrating more and more open source projects and, and technologies. And, and I believe it really is a bit more about how humans are catching up in terms of, you know, mindset change, uh, really embracing what open source is all about. So it's not just the availability of source code, but it is the access to uh, the open source communities. And most of these communities are global. Um, so you really get uh, a lot of people, viewpoints, experience uh, that people share with each other. And it's not just about the technology itself, but how uh, the developers, architects, um, and everybody who works for these organizations uh, start to learn more about the technology, the requirements, and start to work together on uh, on solving challenges that that they all have so i think it's just yeah. the natural evolution path and uh somewhere it takes less time and in some other areas it takes more time to uh, uh for the players and ecosystem to uh get fully into it okay uh neil do you think things are are, are shifting further i mean the the questioner uh, almost sounds like the questioner wants uh, all traditional telecom systems to be set aside and, and open source to be put in place. But of course, that's not really a, a realistic scenario, is it? And, and I don't think it's a desirable either one, either way. I mean, look, <clears throat> 1992, I launched the first internet service provider here in the UK. We ran on NetBSD and we used GateD, we used Bind, all of these were um, open source. So when people ask me this question, I, I'm, I'm kind of puzzled by it because you know, without open source and, and some of the fantastic open source projects out there, there is no network. Let's be realistic. If you crack open most of vendors kit today, it's running Linux, it's running BSD, it's running some form of open source. But my kind of point on this, um, and, and I'm having been involved in open source since the eight, late 80s, I'm kind of almost at the so what point of it. For me, you know, if I was to survey my customers and say, how many of you care about what software I'm running? I predict very few of them will have a view. So the way I look at this is, is what's going to deliver what I need to deliver what my customers needs. If it's open source, fantastic. If it's not, then that's okay. If it's something I have to create myself, perhaps I create it, perhaps I share it with the open source community, maybe or maybe not. I don't know. But 
the one thing that I think is becoming more and more concerning to operators for sure, and, and we have some concerns here, is not all open source is as open as it appears to be. And, and at what we are looking for is much more uh, transparency on licensing and IPR and the things that kind of scare not just network operators, but other businesses into not using um, open source or actually any kind of licensing, frankly, not just for open source. So we want to see much clearer, much more transparent who actually owns this, who has intellectual property rights over it, because it's not always clear. I think the other thing the question I was asking was probably more about open standards rather than standards. Um, as, as quite rightly said earlier, we've been using, you know, without standards, there's nothing. Uh, and we're, a, we're an exemplar industry for following standards. But I believe in standards that we've got too focused on create the standard, then launch the thing. What I want to see us get back to is launch the thing, then standardize it if necessary, because we end up with standards that are common denominator type standards where everybody's happy. And when everybody's happy, usually we've compromised. I want to see a few more standards where not everybody's happy because that makes it exciting. It makes it demanding of what we're trying to do. Uh, I'm not saying everyone should just kind of veto every single standard, of course, but I do think our current approach is weakening our innovation and weakening some of the, 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 the really bleeding edge technologies that we could deploy. Um, but look, if you, I don't need to be convinced about open source. I've been writing code um, since since most of us didn't even know the internet existed. So, you know, I'm out there um, pushing this, but it's going to work for us. It's going to be transparent and, and ultimately it's going to deliver what we need. And if it does those three things, why wouldn't you use it? Okay. Yeah. And I think I think you'd find a lot of supporters with what you were saying there about the the way to get consensus in, in the industry. And it's very hard to get 100% uh, in any organization or any industry. Uh, Ahmed, let's come to you uh, here. You know, what's your views on on how the, the, the use of maybe um, uh, open source, specific open source telco tools are, are sort of blending into the to the current telecom environment? So from my side, I will divide it in two ways, let's say. If we are talking regarding infrastructure, so uh, we know that in infrastructure, everything is running in Linux and everything are, let's say, uh, open source and but if you are let's say if the, if the question was more focusing on the network my point of view is network function we cannot let's say have what at, at least all the telco founder are doing more more than 12 or 13 years let's say and we know also that all the telco founder what they are doing is working and was testing and they have let's say the market is tested by several uh, let's say csps and to, to go, let's say, to some network function open source, for me, it's, at least you need to have, to have several people that they need to maintain, to develop, and each release regarding from TGPP release to implement. So to, that means you need to have several people that they are working and putting the network and trying to improve the network function. And the thing is, okay, we know that we, Telecom founders that they are here, they, they are doing this since more more than 12, 13 years, or maybe maybe more. And we know it's working. So and also their product, they are basing at least as uh, Neil says, on open source also, some Linux and so on. And if the question, let's say, is only to to not to have everything free and to be, let's say, to say, okay, I have my network function. Uh, based on open source or some product. Don't forget, not as Neil said very well, that means open source doesn't mean it's free because you need to pay some sub sub subscription to pay on um, different things or professional services, let's say, to if you want to improve. And don't forget also, that means as CSP, we improve a lot of uh, product like OpenStack because as we are coming with Telco, new things, so where at least we need to have some specific feature and that means all the community of open source they are trying get, getting let's say this benefit from these um, uh, new features that csps are uh, pushing to the open community yeah yeah absolutely and everything needs support and uh, always be very wary of anything that is uh, does look absolutely free because it never is of course uh, miguel let's come to you for a final uh, thought on this 
Yes, I think most of the points I was going to make have been covered, but, uh, you know, it's critical to be, I guess, like pragmatic, like what problem are you solving and what's the best solution for that sol uh, that problem they are solving. Like Neil said, do customers care at the end of the day? Is the solution the best that it can be at the right price or cost of the business? That should drive the decision. And then, you know, I think for some of the tools or applications, then you really want to, you know, you, you need that supportability, right? Like you need the uh, the vendor that helps you uh, when things don't work and also ensures interoperability with other solutions from other vendors or from the, the open source communities. I think there is definitely value in that. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a combination of both. There is space for using open source, contributing code to open source. And there are times where you want to get the differentiation that you can build together with some of your vendors. They might use bits and pieces of uh, open source projects to build their solution and then differentiate it because at the end of the day, we're in a very competitive market. Yeah, absolutely. Great points there, Miguel. Uh, okay, so in the uh, interest of time, because we're already way past the, the halfway mark of the show, going to hand uh, back over to Guy at this point. Yeah, thanks very much, Ray. Time is flying um, and more questions to get through. So time now to check in one last time on our audience poll for the Cloud Native Telco Summit. One question, seven answer options. Pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And the question we have been asking is, Cloud Native is set to deliver substantial benefits to telcos, but what are the main challenges to its adoption? And you can see the current votes right here. No, they don't add up to 100%. That's because you can vote for multiple choices. Now, if we look at, uh, where are we doing? The penultimate one down there. Um, need to retain legacy systems, apps, functions. That's that's pretty high as a, as a barrier there, um, as is the incompatible existing operational structure. Obviously, there are still major challenges um, that the industry feels it needs to overcome. Now, if you've, got to, if you've yet to vote, please do so, because the more votes, the better the results. And we're keeping the polls open until the end of the summit, which is uh, about midnight tonight. OK, back to our Q&A. We've got another about, ooh, what's that, 10, 15 minutes or so remaining. So we've got time for some more questions if we've got some punchy answers as we enter this sprint phase of the Cloud Native Telco. So over <laughs> to you, Ray. <laughs> OK, nice reference there, Guy. Thanks. Uh, and according to the poll, looks like incompatible existing operational structure is the biggest telco challenge to Cloud Native. Um, and I guess the question is, if that is a massive challenge, how do we overcome it? Uh, very quickly, anybody got any thoughts on this? Anybody want to, to suggest a, a solution to, uh, yeah, Heather, let's come to you. I will be pithy. Um, it, it works on culture. <laughs> uh, we, we, we need to figure out uh, how to modernize uh, culture and spend more time and resources teaching our existing folks within telecoms than firing them and hiring new young people. This is the place where it is, how do we grow ourselves? And I think that we can do it. We need to care a lot about that as <laughs> opposed to aping Facebook, to be quite blunt. <laughs> <laughs> Did right. that get <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Heather. And uh, Neil, is, are, are the operational structures that different? Is it, is it hard to change from, from the you know, traditional way of doing things to new way of doing things? I mean, I, mean, I think that's an irrelevance. Also, I think culture has become a dangerous word. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's kind of used to brush over people who have valuable experience and valuable concerns. And, and certainly... <clears throat> You know, um, the, the the approach that you need to take, as with any problem in engineering, is explain the problem you're trying to solve. And great engineers will help you solve that problem, irrespective of org organization, irrespective of, of, of where they sit, irrespective of um, what senior management want to say and or, or want us to do. So, um, you know, we encourage, we have an approach in BT, which is, you know, we encourage each part of the, the business that, that we're, the, 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 sorry, the technology teams to kind of build to a certain maturity level 
And then when we get to a certain maturity level, we try to work a kind of standardization of it. Otherwise, you get in the way of what people are trying to do. Training is absolutely crucial to this, though. And make and it's not about, you know, the training isn't there. It is absolutely there. We, in fact, we built our own program around um, cloud infrastructure and building cloud infrastructure. Um, but m ensuring that you have an, a, a team that is focused, that, you know, that our great engineers is, are focused on the problems of the future rather than kind of cranking the handle of the past, which is which is what we have too often in telco. Um, and I think if you've got that, they're already building it. In fact, they've probably built it and you don't even know that they've built it. It's under someone's desk hiding. Um, great leaders will find those people, the, the gatekeepers of, of, of our industry, um, and they will enable them to take what they're learning, what they're building themselves and actually make it mainstream. And, and for us in BT, that's exactly what happened with BT Network Cloud. It started off as, a, as an under the desk project um, and, and, and as it kind of grew into something that's now running millions of customers, um, mobile service day in, day out. So, um, but, but be careful of the word culture, um, because it's, it's become a, and, and I've seen it in some organizations become a weapon, um, rather than the enabler that it should be. And, and I think what it's about is, is open-mindedness, uh, and great leaders who move the obstacles for engineers out of the way. Okay, great points there, Neil. Uh, Ildiko, is this really just like a, you know, a, a question of, uh, well, like Neil said, sort of opening up the opportunities for people who are introducing new ways of working within an organization and helping everybody to see that, understand it, and maybe, you know, uh, help to develop it further? Yeah, I I wanted to reflect on both what, what, what Heather and, and Neil were saying and just kind of turning the word culture into maybe mindset and uh, just put out a reminder that in my experience when people use the term cloud native that can be a marketing term that can be a sales term that can be a direct equivalent of containers while in reality cloud native is a set of principles it's a concept and it directly boils down to design principles but in, on many regions, people are um, putting technology choices before those principles. So I think some of the challenges of actually applying cloud native to existing um, deployments and new designs is, is the challenge of we want to solve everything with a technology as opposed to really understanding what the term cloud native means, what it means for an application to run on top of any cloud platform out there. And once we prioritize the design principle, then we can look into the technology choice, the skill set that the people need to have and really take the steps from there. And honestly, it should be much easier if we just go in the right order. Uh, thanks, Ildiko. Uh, uh, Ahmed, is your view, are uh, operational structures, you know, already suitable for the, the, the development and uh, embracing of, of cloud native processes? For me, yes, at least, let's say if I can take my, my example, let's say personally, so, so I have some trainer, you know, to understand how virtualization is working, cloudification is working, you know, everything, you can find everything on the internet, for example, to how Kubernetes, for example, is working. So at least you, the only thing that you need is to be have to be open and let's say to challenge person that they want to learn and uh, to to improve their skills. Because as you as engineers, so you should be capable to do let's say to 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 solve everything and let's say to 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 fight with different problems that you can face. And for me, it's only some, I would not say, I would not say open mindset, but let's say to be open to, to love learning. And the structure, let's say, if we can take from legacy one, what we had or what we have actually, okay, is some structure, but you need to be adaptable to go to another st structure as far and as, as soon as possible you can. You need only to, your mindset to be able to learn quickly and to not we are not expecting, let's say, to to know everything, to know uh, everything specifically, but only to understand how the, the, the technology and how the thing is working. 
Yeah, oh, definitely an ongoing process. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Heather, another quick thought from you, and then we'll go back to Guy for the next question. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, Neil, um, everything that you said uh, was amazing. Culture can be weaponized. Um, I've experienced it, especially as a woman um, in this industry. Um, but the point is the culture or mindset might be the better term of our infrastructure is cattle, not pets, for example. And that takes work. You know, like it takes some time. But alongside you, and I think I said this, um, our, our, our experience, our wisdom, our people who have been in this industry for so long should not be let go because they can grow, they will grow, they care about the infrastructure more than they care about marketing terms, but we also need to figure out how to enable more young people to feel um, excited about being part of what we do, which is delivering the internet into every single person's pocket every single day. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, one of the key takeaways from yesterday's uh, live shows was it, it's absolutely vital that to, to, to move this forward, to move, to enable the cloud native telco you need telco people who understand telecom infrastructure, networks and services to be able to bring this forward. It's not just a case of bringing in people with some cloud experience to turn uh, things around and, and introduce anything new. Uh, OK, thanks for those views. Uh, Guy, have we got time for another question? We do indeed. In fact, we have time for two questions because I'm determined we are going to get two questions in before the end of the show uh, so as not to upset all our audience who have been swamping us with questions whilst we've been on the air. So we're implementing quick fire round rules here. So punchy, punchy, punchy. Uh, here's the first one we want to get in. Uh, it's a tricky one, this as well. What's the overall impact on energy consumption in cloud native versus more traditional models? Or if I could maybe flip that a bit, do we know of any energy consumption issues by moving towards cloud native? Are we increasing energy? Are we decreasing? Is it not a direct factor? Any 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 quick quick thoughts on the power? Because it's very, very topical at the moment. Neil. I'll give you one. Yeah, look, um, all the old technology has got these big capacitors on it. There's no control to depower it or power it up. It's just on all the time. And clearly the world is not on all the time. People sleep, people eat, etc. Everything new that we're putting in, you know, uses energy as it requires it. And actually, I'll give a shout out to Intel, who've done a phenomenal job of power management, but they're actually not getting enough traction in an industry, both in the software industry and in our industry, to enable a lot of those software management capabilities. So everyone go and do their homework on the new capabilities Intel have got, because they, they make a massive difference. And to give you an understanding of it, uh, in the UK, we are about almost 1% of the energy usage um, <coughs> today. And that's five and a half thousand central offices in tomorrow's network with cloud native and, and cloud technologies. We only need 800 of those central offices. So you can see the benefits in energy saving that you're going to get by that trend, that, that move from old to new. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Neil. Good points there. And yes, everyone should do their homework here. Uh, Miguel, let's go across to you first. Yeah, so so similar, right? Like I think we, we do get a benefit, yes, from the technology refresh itself. And then there are benefits that the the kind of like Kubernetes resource orchestration and so on enable that we haven't even unleashed yet, right? So I think there is more to come. Yeah, that's, I really, really hope so. Ildiko, some uh, some quick thoughts from you. Yes, uh, I just wanted to reflect on that. This is an an ongoing process on the infrastructure layer. So like in OpenStack, there has been a few projects that we're looking into how to make resource usage as efficient 
as possible. And to build on that, there is also an effort forming uh, within the open infra communities to form a sustainability working group to specifically look into uh, these kind of questions and challenges and how to make sure that the infrastructure uh, does its part when it comes to uh, being more sustainable, using less energy, uh, and also reusing energy that it, that gets generated in the large data centers. So if anyone in the audience would be interested in joining um, that working group, um, please uh, find me on the World Wide Web. Uh, it should be really easy. <laughs> Indeed, it, it absolutely is. And uh, we encourage everyone to join these groups. So uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, Ahmed, up to you first. Yeah, I uh, just want to add, let's say, okay, for me, at least if you want to say, if the, moving to the cloud, we have some energy uh, savings, so at least we need to compare what is comparable, let's say, for example, we need to take the, the, the whole system, what you have as legacy with the same capacity and the same forecast traffic, but you have to compare and the same. And as Miguel and Neil said, so the work, let's say, was not done from today, we need to move everything to the cloud. So cloud and let's say to be able to compare what we have previously, the legacy one, that's mean the, the sizing and dimensioning, to make some, and to compare it to what we have in cloud, in cloud and to see if uh, we are meeting, let's say, the saving energy. Yeah, there, there's a huge amount of work going on at the moment about measuring and, um, and, and agreeing across the industry here. That's a, a massive topic. And, and Heather, uh, round us off on this, uh, this power issue. Yeah. Yeah, um, I actually think from a technology perspective, things like cloud native really are doing the job of reducing, um, you know, energy consumption. What happens is that then sometimes turns into a business model that enables people to use that to do maybe questionable things. So um, maybe a little bit of a surprise. Um, I'm going to say that, for example, it is doing a great job, but it has enabled a PNL for things like Bitcoin mining that is destroying a lot of towns around the world. Um, I think that there is a regulation around business models and what you're doing with that energy uh, improvement consumption. And I'm going to actually just say governmental regulation is important and we should not ever let it go. Right, great great points, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for those. Uh, Ray, look, we are almost out of time, <laughs> but we do have this VNF, CNF question that's come in and it's really appropriate because we that's do. the panel we've just had. So let me hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Guy. Yeah, this question in just uh, during the show. And the question is obviously from somebody who, who's looking to adopt cloud native functions. And the question is, before I move to cloud native functions, I want to see something tangible. Are there any open source software tools available to test CNFs? How can we validate CNFs before we move to using them? Um, so anybody want to come in on, on any thoughts here for, uh, for, for service providers, network operators looking to ad adopt CNFs? Can they be tested? Is there a safe and easy way to do this? Um, yes, Heather. Uh, this is a thing we're working on in LFN. Uh, we are uh, building bridges with OpenStack, uh, sorry, Open Infra Foundation and uh, CNCF uh, to uh, create um, uh, testing frameworks for that. Uh, interoperability and testing within the concept of being a uh, cloud native from a network function. So it, it's happening. Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and uh, Miguel. Less maybe on the open source or free tools available, but as um, you know, some of the early adopters, we kind of go through the motions and, and get the integration, the test and interoperability done for CNFs. There are more and more of the usual, you know, usual suspects when you think about companies that can do testing for you, assurance, tooling, and so on, that have the capabilities, right? They, they we've definitely used their help uh, in the early days until we were able to build kind of our own framework for uh, testing, validation, and integration. So there, there are solutions in the market. Okay, great. Thanks, Miguel. And uh, Neil, final uh, thoughts from you. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way of figuring out how to test it is to actually go build it. 
and 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 break it, you know, and obviously in a safe place, not not live with customers. But um, I, I wouldn't be overly focused on trying to not know how to test this because if you know how to test it, then you really know how it works. You know what you're going to be looking for. So my encouragement is is give give all your engineers another laptop. Let them load up whatever they need to do to run this stuff and break it and rebuild it and break it and really get to the, the nuts and bolts of how it works. And then actually as they're creating the, the technology and, and the, the capabilities and the use cases, they'll be able to write the testing. As Miguel says, there are a few great companies that, that um, can help you with that. We work with Canonical who've helped us massively with that. Um, but get out and do it and, and, and kind of, you know, Share experiences with your colleagues. I oh, broke this, or you know, um, get get everyone on Discord so they can exchange stuff real time and, and learn as, as a as a group. Um, it, you know, there's no there is no better way of learning how stuff works and how it breaks other than by getting on and doing it. And and there's so many resources out there today that allows you to to do that. Um, and training courses and certifications. Just dive in and, and actually you'll find very quickly how exciting and what a great kind of space this actually is is, is and, and is growing like crazy. Get in early, be an expert. It will do your CV, no, no damage either. Uh, absolutely. And uh, just a, a, a quick plug for Telecom TV's own editorial coverage of the industry. Today we had a story uh, based on this about Telco Cloud training and some initiatives there. So I would encourage people to go and check that out. Okay, Guy, I think we have reached the end of the show. So I'll hand back over to you at this point. Yep, thanks, Ray. And uh, talking about breaking things, this panel has been so intense, I've uh, broken my pen. So that goes in the bin. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> How better way to learn. Uh, thanks so much to all of our guests who joined us for this live program. And of course, to our audience for sending in tons of questions. Yeah, absolutely. Great show and a great summit. And next year, Guy will be coming back for the fifth, let me say it again, the fifth Telecom TV Cloud Native Telco Summit. And then we can get to do it all over again. Oh, yes. And also we want to see more progress made by the industry. Also, though, if you've got any topics you want covered, then please do let us know. And if you missed any of the earlier programmes over the past two days, they will all be available to watch on demand from tomorrow. Ray and I will return in about five weeks time with the 5G Evolution Summit. We'll be covering private 5G, FWA, 5G Advanced and much, much more. Until then, thank you for watching and goodbye.